Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Lunch and Learn webinar series. I'm Meyer Thacker. I am an equity strategist here at Zach's Investment Research. And this is an update uh, in September, um, just a day before, the, the at the time of this recording uh, is Thursday, uh, September 5th, just a day before the big non-farm payrolls report comes out uh, tomorrow uh, on Friday. So, um, you know, by the time you see this, we may have already gotten the results of the August non-farm payrolls report, but um, recording stay earlier just because uh, a lot of data has already come out. I want to review that with you. And uh, the data that we have seen thus far uh, for August, you know, continue to point in and, and continue to move in the wrong direction. So job market indicators for August. Uh, again, we haven't gotten the non-farm payrolls report yet as of this recording, but everything else continues to weaken in August. And uh, because of all of this and the general macro view that I've been having for the past you know, 15, 16 months, 17 months, um, I believe that you know the Zach's earning certain proxy, which we'll talk about and uh, you might be already familiar with, is going to outperform over the next 12 months, especially if my thesis is correct that we are descending into recession. So let's take a look at that. Um, so again, economic risks, I believe, are rising. Um, we can't know for sure, but we can at least speak in terms of probabilities uh, because things are happening that usually don't happen outside of recessions. Um, and there's many, many charts that show that, but, you know, because we're crossing all sorts of thresholds on employment and unemployment uh, metrics, the probability of recession has increased significantly. Again, that doesn't mean that we will be in recession, um, or it doesn't mean that things will necessarily get significantly worse, but the probability that things will get worse uh, in the form of a recession has increased significantly ever since we got that July non-farm payrolls report. Um, but even prior to that, leading economic indicators that we've been talking about here for quite a while, ISM manufacturing, ISM new orders, um, and uh, earnings contraction among cyclical companies. Remember the S&P 500, we'll take a look at that in a second. The S&P 500 is, broadly speaking, a collection of two types of businesses, right? We have long-term secular growth companies, but then we also have mature cyclicals, uh, also known as value. Um, but I prefer to call them cyclicals because they don't really compound and grow over time. They just go through cycles because they've reached, uh, you know, peak um, in terms of, uh, you know, demand. Uh, and these types of cyclicals, which include banks, it includes, um, you know, materials companies, it includes uh, you know, many industrial companies, um, these companies, if you aggregate them together collectively, um, have been in an earnings recession now for four quarters, and that continues through Q2 of this year. Um, so, you know, again, a number of leading indicators for the market continue to show that the probability of recession has increased um, for many months now, but especially since we got that July non-farm payrolls report in which the unemployment rate ticked up to 4.3%, triggering um, the widely known SOM rule, uh, among other uh, you know, indicators that suggest that you know, unemployment has crossed a threshold from which there is no return. And so because of this, the market volatility is increasing. And then specifically, I believe that we're going to get another disappointing non-farm payrolls report tomorrow for the month of August, uh, when we find out on Friday, September 6th. Um, and the reason being is that, you know, uh, updates from August from a number of other surveys that have a leading edge to the non-farm payrolls report continue to move in the wrong direction. Uh, one is the Conference Board Labor Differential Survey. This is from their Consumer Confidence Index. Um, there's a sub a sub index um, really called the labor differential, which looks at the spread between uh, respondents that say that jobs are, you know, plentiful and those who respond that jobs are hard to get. 
And so if you look at the spread between the two, um, that has had a phenomenal track record at forecasting the national unemployment rate by several months. Uh, and that continues to deteriorate in August. Um, and so I believe that that, you know, forecasts, um, you know, 5% unemployment by the end of this year. Uh, remember, I, I did, you know, kind of get in front of that earlier this year. I did say that I, I expect the unemployment rate to go up, and it has. Um, and these leading, leading indicators for the unemployment rate uh, continue to worsen. Um, at least through August. So I believe that that is still on track, that we will see the unemployment rate move up even more um, by the end of the year, and possibly even in the month of August when we get that report tomorrow on September 6th. Um, regional Fed employment surveys, uh, and this is from these services um, indexes that they track, that continues to show that unemployment continues to deteriorate um, from the different regions uh, that, again, is from the services side. We already know manufacturing has been in recession for two years, but now services uh, employment is starting to come down. And we know that because we've seen that come out in the Beige Book uh, yesterday, um, that regional Fed employment, services employment uh, indexes continue to decline. We've seen layoff announcement trackers continue to show a rise in layoff announcements. Uh, this is from... Challenger Gray, as well as from Macro Edge and other um, sources like that, they continue to show that layoff announcements are on the rise. Uh, this is very important because you know a lot of people say that unemployment rate increases are due to labor supply rather than layoffs. But uh, I I think that these numbers beg to differ. Um, we will see very closely how permanent job losers track on the report tomorrow. Uh, but that number has been rising consistently over the past year, um, albeit from very low levels, um, but it also has triggered another threshold that typically doesn't happen outside of recessions, which is that permanent job losers crossing above the three-year moving average. Um, going back, you know, about 40 years, it never has done that outside of recessions, and it's doing that now. But we get a big update on that tomorrow. I'll be watching that like a hawk. Um, but permanent job losers is a very important number to be tracking. Um, the ISM Manufacturing Employment Index, um, that also continues to drop. And we've seen, you know, very um, widely now that we've seen a lot of negative revisions of prior month's job posting or job reports, right? We saw the big benchmark revision, revision by the BLS. That was the second biggest negative revision uh, ever. Um, going back to 2009 being a bigger one. So remember, negative revisions of this size, the extent and magnitude of these revisions are only consistent with recessions. This typically is a symptom of recession. When we go back and, uh, you know, tabulate all the, the jobs, you know, from the initial survey to the third estimate, the number, the extent of the negative revisions are so big um, it only typically happens this way in past recessions, and that's happening right now. So again, all of this together, I believe, is going to lead, suggest that you know we're going to get another big disappointment in the August report. We'll see if that comes to pass. But even if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me because the trend is down. We may get a month of a bounce, maybe a two-month bounce, but the inevitable trend is down. Um, especially because we've triggered a number of other thresholds and crossed those thresholds um, across multiple different indicators that, um, you know, maybe a one month bounce won't really change. And so because of this uncertainty, because of the rising probability of recession and all of the negative downstream effects that would have, you know, in terms of uh, rising unemployment, the Zach's Earning Certain Proxy is built precisely for these types of environments. Um, it provides low volatility, durable earnings growth through all macro environments, right? And we have seen that, you know, and these are the types of companies that we own in the portfolio. Again, companies that are not really, um, you know, not really uh, susceptible to rising unemployment, not really susceptible to recession, um, not really, you know, susceptible to any kind of macro slowdown. 
uh, because these are companies that produce products and services that are required. As long as there's a population, um, you know, this these companies will continue to do well, and they have done well in past recessions, and that's why we own them in the portfolio, because they have proven um, an ability to navigate through difficult macro environments relatively unscathed. And, you know, we can see that, you know, through these, you know, through these charts right here, uh, these are just a couple of examples of companies that we own in the portfolio. And you can see how well they do. Just look at the dotted orange lines that you see on these on the screen for these four different companies. And you can see that through these shaded regions, which are the recessions, um, they've had, you know, no, uh, almost no um, sensitivity to the business cycle. They don't get hit during recessions. They continue to grow their earnings through recessions. And that's how we add value in this portfolio. We look for these types of high quality compounders that aren't susceptible to recessions, that you know aren't susceptible to high or low interest rates, you know that aren't susceptible to high or low employment levels, that aren't susceptible to strong or weak dollar. Um, or other different factors that happen, you know, at least over these past 20 years. Uh, so these are the types of recession resistant, high quality compounders that we look for. Um, so this is a chart of the aggregate portfolio uh, of 70 companies that we own in the portfolio. You can see how well they, how durable these companies are throughout all different macro environments that we've been through the, over these past 25 years. Uh, you can see that these are companies that, you know, have navigated their respective companies through all kinds of ups and downs and just continue slow and steady compound growth over time. So we believe that this is the ultimate long-term buy and hold portfolio. Um, this should be the core portfolio of all investors in, in our view. Um, and then you can layer on levels of risk depending on what your macro view, you know, is. Um, but this is a core portfolio that I believe all investors should own at all times. Um, and then you can always, you know, always layer on, you know, exposure to the cyclicals when the time is right. Um, but here's an update on some of the jobs uh, figures that we've seen um, through August. You can see that job, job openings um, and quits, the quits rate, you know, remain well below trend. And, you know, they're both in contraction. We just saw the lowest number of job openings um, on the JOLTS report this past, you know, during this week. Um, it continues to decelerate. Um, and you can also see that, you know, and I don't sh have it shown here on this chart, but on the next chart, you can see that, you know, job openings per unemployed. This is also a very important figure. Um, and this is a figure that is tracked very closely by the Fed. Uh, that hit fresh cycle lows. Um, again, we're quite elevated though it's at 1.07 but remember um you know this stuff is not always about looking at absolute levels right you can say that you know this level that we saw in 2007 was already below the prior level in 2001 that last time we had a recession so it's really not about comparing the level that we're at today versus levels that we were at 10 or 20 years ago what it's about is the trend right where in, in what direction are we headed? So it's entirely possible that we could be in recession this time around with a job openings per unemployed at a 1.2 reading, right? So it more, I think the, the greater importance is the trend uh, of the direction that we're going in. For example, in the past, a 5% unemployment rate um, is considered full employment and by no means is 5% unemployment rate, um, something to worry about. But if we got to 5% unemployment today, that would be an outright recession because it's all about where did we come from to get to that 5%, right? So we started you know, at 3.4% at the lows, which is very low, historically low. And then now we're at 4.3%, right? Um, so it's all about the direction of the trend, are we rising or are we falling? Because remember, markets are priced not on where we are today versus where we were ten years ago. The markets are priced in terms of where we are today versus last year, and where we're going out into the future by a year or so. 
And so if the trend is down, right, that puts incremental pressure on earnings for the S&P because as this number keeps marching lower, right, this has a correlation with the unemployment rate. Um, and if the unemployment rate continues to tick higher, that puts marginal pressure on retail sales, on PCE, on all the downstream numbers that get affected by unemployment, right? And so sequentially that puts pressure on growth figures. So if this continues to move in the wrong direction, this will put added pressure on S&P earnings, uh, especially within retail. So that is the big warning that we keep seeing. And now we see that job openings per unemployed again, continue to decelerate and we're now well below pre-pandemic levels, as you can see here, we were at 1.2 pre-pandemic, you know, and then we got up to two, which was very, very, um, you know, loose labor market, you know, there was lots of jobs, right, at that time. But now that's entirely normalized. And now we're, we've shot, you know, well past that period of normalization. So it's entirely possible that we could be in recession right now, even though that ratio is at 1.07 which is well above the last time we were in recession in 2008, when that number was 0.8, right? And again, it's all about skating to where the puck is going, not where it is now. And that trend is abundantly clear as to where it's going. Um, now, recall what Jay Powell said at the Jackson Hole speech two weeks ago. He said, quote, we do not seek nor welcome further cooling in, the la in labor market conditions. And remember, he said that when job openings, when this chart was at 1.2. So it was up here back when he said that. And now it's cooled, you know, in terms of a critical number, which, by the way, he measured, he specifically mentioned this number as one of the numbers they look at. So, you know, the labor market has absolutely cooled as of that speech. And it's cooled even further since that speech, which was only two weeks ago. So he mentioned that when it was at 1.2, now it's at 1.07. And I mean, are, are we really willing to bet that it's just going to stop right here? Because remember, unemployment and really job, you know, the, the rate of job growth is a momentum driven phenomenon, right? As companies put hiring freezes, that is sort of a self fulfilling prophecy um, because. Um, of the sort of domino effect that that has on incremental demand. As it becomes harder and harder for people to find jobs, that starts to alter people's consumption behaviors, right? And as that alters, you know, consumption patterns, that affects other companies, which then similarly follow suit in putting hiring freezes at their respective companies. And so that continues to sort of uh, permeate throughout the economy. And so that's the reason why it gets very tricky is that once it crosses a certain threshold, and I have on this chart one particular way to measure, you know, possible threshold level is, you know, in this case, the three-year moving average. This is a 36-month EMA. And as you can see over the past several times here, um, every time we've crossed below that 36 month moving average, we've been in a confirmed recession because, you know, it doesn't just stop there. It continues to weaken much further. And this is just one example. We've got many more examples uh, of, you know, other measures of the labor market that have triggered, you know, this threshold of crossing um, its 36 month EMA. And as you can see here, we crossed that quite a while ago. And that's why we've seen, you know, significant further deterioration beyond just that. So, you know, once you cross a certain threshold, once unemployment hits a certain critical mass, it becomes very, very difficult to put an end to it. That's why, you know, I'm very, very concerned about where this all is headed. Here's the household employment, right? This is also another thing that people need to be watching. You know, everybody talks about the headline number, which is the non-farm payrolls report, which is important, but so is the household employment survey. So this, as opposed to, you know, surveying businesses, this survey um, asks individuals, um, you know, what's your job situation like? And the people that report being employed um, has entered 
stagnation now. So as of the July report, that number is zero. And you can see here that that's never happened. I mean, it got there very briefly um, at zero, you know, at, at one point in 2014, but only for a month. So if this number enters contraction, that'll be the first time we have ever been in contraction, according to the Household Employment Survey, outside of recessions. The only time this number has ever entered, you know, a contraction is during recessions, as you can see here. We've never been in contraction during economic expansionary periods. As you can see, throughout the 1990s, it never went below zero. Throughout the 2000s, it never went below zero. Throughout the 2010s, it never went below zero. And every prior period, it's never went below zero. It's only gone below zero during recessions. And that too, during you know recessions that are already underway, this is not a leading indicator. This actually could be a coincident indicator. So if this number goes into contraction next month, you know, when we get that report tomorrow, September 6th, um, you know, that is a very, very important indicator that suggests that we may already be in recession. So unless if we get a big bounce back, you know, that, you know, kind of puts a big damper on the recession thesis. So we'll see if we get that kind of like what happened here in 2014, where we had, you know, a brief period of zero, you know, growth about, and then it followed by a bounce back. If that happens this time around, I'll, I'll be more than willing to admit that, uh, you know, that this was all, you know, that this was, that this analysis was incorrect. But as you can see on this next chart in 2014, we never had a meaningful uptick in unemployment. We never triggered you know, in this case, the three-year moving average crossover, whereas we are triggering it now here today. So, you know, other indicators never really confirmed anything really to be worried about back when this happened. Whereas this time around, we're seeing a number of, of, of thresholds that we're crossing that historically never get crossed outside of recessions. So here we can see every single time we've been in a recession, the unemployment rate has crossed over the 36 month moving average. And here we're seeing it again here today. Again, if this turns out to be a false call and we just simply roll over again, then that'll be the first time in 60 years that has happened. Um, that's, you know, that's a probability that I don't, that I would not like to bet against. So again, this market in my view is extremely uh, dangerous. Um, now here's another way to think of it. The, the, the conference board labor differential, as I mentioned, the spread between jobs, plentiful and jobs, hard to get hit fresh cycle lows in August. Um, this survey has quite an impressive two month leading edge on the national unemployment rate. And I believe unless if this number changes really quickly and starts moving up again, um, I believe that we're going to get to 5% unemployment uh, by the end of this year, you know, compared to today's 4.3%. That's not a long time from now. We're already, you know, into September. We've only got a couple of months left, you know, before the end of the year. Uh, that would be quite a move up. And if that happens, uh, there will be a significant market, you know, drawdown because that's not a number that, that the market is ready or even willing or priced or anywhere remotely priced, um, you know, for, you know, in terms of being ready for that type of a, a you know, that type of a move. Um, you know, the, the, the effects of that are significant. Um, it will put a big, it'll deliver quite a significant hit to retail sales. And remember consumption is 70% of GDP, right? And, uh, you know, GDP right now is still healthy, but uh, as I mentioned before, GDI is not confirming GDP. And historically speaking, every time GDI does not confirm GDP, meaning every time there's a divergence between GDP and gross domestic income, we have seen sig significant, not just slight, but significant downward revisions to GDP. And we just got, you know, Q2 GDP at just 1.3%, whereas GDP was reported at 
So, you know, there's something going on here that just doesn't add up. Um, and there's been a couple of academic research papers on this published by the Fed, um, Fed Insider Research Papers that have, you know, written about the importance of GDI, especially at business cycle turning points. For, for whatever reason, um, gross domestic income starts to diverge from gross domestic product right around turns in the business cycle from expansion to contraction. Um, and that's what's happening right now. Uh, so I believe that there's, you know, quite a lot of room for negative revisions on the GD GDP report, but we'll have to wait and see before we get that. But GDP, remember, is a, at best, coincident and at worst, a lagging indicator. Um, in fact, during the 2001 recession, we never even had GDP contraction, and yet the market was down 40, you know, 40 percent, um, you know, during that recession from top to bottom. So, you know, those that cite the GDP report um, are, you know, are, 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 are using data points that are sometimes lagging and in some cases not even relevant to you know the macro discussion when it comes to the returns of the S&P 500. Um, but in each of those recessions, we did get a significant spike in the unemployment rate, as we saw here in 2001. We saw that you know, crossover happen. And uh, so interestingly enough, we saw this big spike in unemployment back in 2001 during that recession. Um, but if you go back and look at it, we never actually got um, GDP, you know, entering contraction ever during that entire time, as surprising as that is. So GDP is not the best number to be watching when it comes to business cycle analysis, especially when it comes to making investment decisions and looking at the risk, you know, profile for stocks. Um, and then the leading cyclical employment index, this is something that I do here, um, this posts the 14th, it's posted now the 14th month of contraction. Again, these six industries that I've identified have a leading edge to them because they start to turn ahead of the broader uh, payrolls. Um, these industries are trucking, plastics and rubber products manufacturing, um, administrative jobs, which includes temporary help services, um, and a couple of others like residential real estate. Uh, collectively speaking, they never enter contraction. They just, they, 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 as you can see here, they never enter contraction except for right ahead of recessions. And you can see they have roughly a six to 12 month lead time. This time it's quite, uh, it's a little bit longer, I believe because we're heading off of this exaggeratedly high level here. So the first couple of months were probably just normalization of that, you know, very high point. But at this point now, it's we're 14 months into that contraction. And it looks as though this is actually starting to come back up. But actually what this is showing is that um, it's still declining on a month over month basis. So if you look at the underlying data here, there's still quite a lot of weakness. It did decline once again in the month of July versus the month of June. It's just that the rate of decline on a year over year basis slowed from the low point. But you can see here that every time, you know, this figure gets under 1% contraction, that's been a confirmed early indicator, early warning sign of recession. And so that hasn't really improved since that low point of 1%. It's actually continued to decline on a month over month basis you know, just not as rapidly as it was on a year over year basis. So this continues to forecast uh, a contraction of true private sector jobs. Um, again, and here's another indication here, the job gains that we've seen over the past year have been primarily government related. Here is a chart that looks at the ratio of private sector jobs to government sector jobs. And I define private sector as you know, the private payrolls minus education and healthcare. Um, because education and healthcare, you can argue that these are actually government adjacent because, you know, they don't go through cycles, right? Um, education never cuts jobs. They never have, you know, a recession. 
Um, and healthcare, they never cut jobs, they never have a recession. As well as government employees, they never have a recession either. So I like to separate, you know, the true private economy from the non-cyclical economy, which is government, education, and healthcare. So if you look at the ratio of the two, you know, in terms of total employees between the true private sector and the non-cyclical sector, and look at the rate of change of that over time, you know, this number is in contraction and it never really gets to this level of contraction outside of recessions. Um, so this tells us that a lot of this, a lot of the strength, whatever strength that we have seen in the jobs figure has been primarily government related or non-cyclical hiring. Um, and in fact, if you look at the hard data over the past 12 months, um, only 38% of all the jobs created based on the monthly non-farm payrolls have been from the true private sector, meaning, um, you know, total jobs minus government jobs, minus healthcare jobs, minus education jobs. If you look at everybody else, they have only accounted for 38% of all jobs created over the past 12 months. 62% have come from government, healthcare, and education. Um, that is not a sustainable source of hiring. Um, and again, this is very reminiscent of things that happened during recessions, as you can see on this chart. So, you know, the fundamentals are not strong. And then let's look at the probably the most important chart, um, which is how does all of this affect the S&P? The S&P is strong because earnings have thus far been strong. Um, particularly because of technology. But if you look at this right here, um, the ISM manufacturing PMI um, has had a 79% R uh, in a correlation, um, as you can see right here, an R of 0 0.79 with an optimal lead time of four months. So this has actually been quite a remarkable leading indicator to S&P earnings by roughly four months, almost two quarters. Um, and as you, as we all know now, manufacturing has been in recession for almost two years, 21 out of the last 22 months we've been in contraction. A lot of those early months though, have been basically normalization from that, you know, exaggerated level that we saw post COVID, you know, when everything just came right back online. So the first couple of months, you can say, well, you know, that's just normalization. But we continue to be in contraction even through the month of August. We just got that report this past week. Again, 47.2 reading. You know, this has been in contraction now for far too long to ignore. And so if you can see here, this again, the ISM manufacturing PMI has a very strong correlation to S&P forward earnings growth expectations. And as you can see now, according to that red line, you know, we've seen an interesting divergence here, um, which now might be in the process of converging. It's a little bit too early to say here because you can see that growth expectations on a forward looking basis for the S&P 500 um, are still quite good at 9.3%. This is the main reason why the market's been so strong, right? But you're starting to see revisions to the downside now. Um, and it's still a little bit early. I'm not going to take a victory lap on this at all yet. But we're starting to see negative revisions come in on a forward basis for the for the full year of 2024 and 2025, right? This is using forward earnings forecasts, um, which is a blend of both fiscal year 2024 as well as 2025. And on a year over year basis, it's up 9.3%, which is good, but you can start to see that it's well off the highs and starting to converge here. So I believe that the longer ISM remains in contraction, the greater the probability that we're going to see estimates being revised down. Manufacturing is not as big of a part of the economy as it was 20 to 25 years ago, but it still has an important correlation to the S&P 500 aggregate earnings growth picture. Um, it doesn't have to be a big component. 
It just has to be something that has a strong correlation with the direction of the economy, right? And as you can see here, even through um, throughout the 2010s, you know, they've had a pretty good correlation to one another. You can see that ISM had a, a very strong swing to the upside, you know, for example, in 2016 to 2019, followed by a strong downward slope from 2019 onwards, um, it really peaked in 2018, I should say, and started to move down quite significantly in 2019 into COVID. And yeah, as you can see here, earnings were being revised down during that entire time. So again, even during more recent times, like 2016 to 2019, um, the ISM has had a very strong correlation to forward S&P earnings growth expectations. So the, I don't believe that this has lost its touch. I don't believe that this is now, you know, something that you can just dismiss. The longer this has, you know, remained in contraction, the longer this remains in contraction, the greater the probability that we're going to see negative revisions on S&P forward earnings. And I believe we're starting to see that now as unemployment starts to weigh on retail sales and things like that. And if you combine all of this with the fact that the S&P 500 valuation is at elevated levels, this presents a very, very, very dangerous combination. You have, you know, unemployment reaching all sorts of tipping points. Um, you have earnings at risk as long as ISM manufacturing remains weak. And you've got stocks at very elevated multiples. This looks at the Schiller PE, which I believe is one of the best um, long-term valuation metrics um, because this looks at normalized earnings throughout you know different multi, you know market cycles. And it's got you know a very strong track record at predicting forward returns by the over the next 10 years. Um, Robert Schiller, Professor Robert Schiller has done a lot of work on that. I love his uh, overall uh, framework of thinking with regards to this. Um, and as you can see here, we're more than one standard deviation above the you know 30 year average on Schiller PE. You know, every time we've gotten this high, you know, forward looking returns have not been good. But especially given the fact that we're at this unique juncture where we see a rising recession risk. At the same time, we see the S and P five hundred valuation at you know very high levels, according to the Schiller PE. Um, this is a very very dangerous time uh, to be betting on the S and P five hundred. So that's why I believe it's high time to switch to the Zach's earning certain proxy. Um, as you can see on this chart, the S and P five hundred has had a lot of volatility when it comes to earnings growth over these you know, these past 20 years, but the Zach's earning certain proxy has been much more stable compared to that. And as you can see on this chart, over time, the compound growth rate has been undeniable. The difference is, you know, a night and day, you know, between the earnings stability, the earnings, um, you know, predictability, and earnings growth cumulatively over time. You know, you can get predictability just by betting on utilities, for example, but you're not going to beat the S&P 500 just owning utilities. You're going to underperform significantly. But look at the difference between not just the earnings predictability, but the earnings compound growth over time. Um, so this is a portfolio with both earnings stability and stronger cumulative compounding power. Um, that is a one-two punch that I believe is the ultimate um, strategy for long-term investors. That's why I continue to believe that the earning certain proxy that we manage here at Zacks is the ultimate core portfolio that we should all be invested in. Um, and then you can always layer on risk as you see fit, um, but this really should be the core holdings that you have all the time. Um, and I believe that this is getting ready now to beat the S&P 500 quite significantly you know, over the next 12 months. Uh, and that is precisely because we're also starting from a compelling rel relative valuation. Um, we've been actually horribly underperforming the S&P over the past year and a half now. Um, 2023 was a significant underperforming year. 
you know, the market was up 26%. We were up 12%, um, big difference there. Um, but then now the difference has really uh, narrowed um, this year. We were down significantly this year as well, but the gap has narrowed quite significantly, especially over the last two months. You know, I believe we're getting to that, you know, that tipping point where if we start to see further deterioration, I believe we're already there, but the market has not yet, um, you know, priced in a recession or anywhere near that just yet. But if we start to get, you know, this number start to come down with regards to uh, forward earnings expectations for the market, uh, I believe that the Zach's earning certain proxy is going to be a significant outperformer. So given these rising job market risks, again, which have countless downstream effects on retail sales and consumer loans, um, I I would think that it's a high it's high time to shift to a portfolio of high quality companies with durable business models, companies that you know can withstand recessions, and that's exactly what we do here with the Zach's earning certain proxy. Again, the four pillars of quality are earning stability, earnings growth, return on invested capital, and free cash flow conversion. Um, if you combine these four factors together, we get you know essentially a bulletproof portfolio. And that's exactly what, you know, I showed in the very early part of the chart, you know, early charts right here. You know, this is durability, right? This is what durability looks like. This is what anti-fragility looks like, right? Sencora, you know, one of the largest drug dis distributors in the world, Mettler Toledo, you know, the biggest um, precision lab equipment um, manufacturer in the world. Novo Nordis, you know, by far the biggest insulin manufacturer who is now expanding, you know, their horizons into other areas like, you know, the GLP-1 class drugs, which help with weight loss and others. You know, these are, you know, entrenched businesses that are not affected by what the job market is doing. Um, and this is what ultimately what durability looks like. You know, portfolio of high quality durability um, and compound growth that I believe will beat the market over a complete market cycle. And we're going to start to see that, I believe, over the next 12 months. Um, and I just wanna show one last chart here. So let's jump into uh, Zach's uh, ZRS world here. This is our Zach's research system, our institutional level uh, software for data analytics and research. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is the average performance. This is not the official returns of our portfolio or the market. I just wanna show you the average um, you know, ballpark figures um, between our portfolio and the S&P 500. You know, we were right in line with the S&P for most of the first quarter. Then we saw a big separation. Um, this was when long-term interest rates rose quite significantly. Um, back when the market had a brief period where it thought that inflation was re-accelerating. Um, but then we really saw, look at the look at the change here. Right when we got that negative jobs report in July, and then we had that Japan carry trade blow up. That gap narrowed significantly here. And we pretty much came in line. Um, our companies actually started to you know, rise even with the market falling. That's exactly what we want to see. Um, this is a big early test on how our portfolio may perform in case we get you know, a significant bear market show up in the, in the broader market. So that gap narrowed to basically zero. We saw this huge relief rally. So the market kind of bounced ahead of us now again, but here we start to see a little bit of market you know, jitters coming back. So the gap has narrowed significantly between us and the market. And you know, again, we're having another banner, banner year. You know, We always do about 10%. You know, this portfolio is really not supposed to be a high flying, you know, um, you know, NVIDIA type, you know, performer, you know, we don't even own NVIDIA or many tech stocks in the portfolio. And yet we're now basically within range of leapfrogging the S&P 500 year to date returns. Um, so last year's gap, I believe is going to be undone entirely. And then as we start that new bull market cycle, whenever the recession that we may get gets fully priced in, you know, I believe that's when the Zach's earning certain proxy is going to show the value that we believe 
it will ultimately show over a complete market cycle. So hope you found this helpful. Um, again, I, I will, you know, see you guys again after we get the non-farm payrolls report. Um, but again, if you have any questions, um, I would love to hear from you. Um, but now I believe is the time to be looking at the Zach Earning Certain Proxy and to be getting into that portfolio. If you have any questions about that portfolio, if you want to get more information about it, please do give us a call at 1-866-794-6065 or send us an email to strategycall at zaxpro.com. All right, talk to you again in our next one. Take care, everybody. Bye.